Good morning. Uh, we're live. Seifeld, uh, today's discussion is focused on the strong box. So where would the group like to start? Elaine, so what, what did you um, observe in Elaine? She was very paranoid. Um, had some like delusional thoughts regarding her boyfriend. Specifically what? Um, that he was having an affair. That um, Elaine's boyfriend was having an affair. Give me uh, some, uh, for someone who hadn't seen the episode yet, uh, provide some details. So uh, let's say um, Elaine's boyfriend presents um, to practice with a chief complaint uh, and uh, brings up what is now the subplot of the strong box. Uh, what information would he provide us? About yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh. About this, about this oh. case. I guess that she, I don't know, seemed on edge. Like he's talking about him being married. Like, like things like you know, he was. Right, right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So, a more, I think more of a clinical pearl. Um, uh, much more than anything you're gonna find on your shelf exam, is that. Um, uh, Again, uh, clinicians always have to keep an open mind with regard to the veracity of uh, our patient's report. Uh, and in the most really sensational circumstances, things have been borne out true. So you really do have to keep an open mind. And I'm not gonna say this live streamed, but we'll, we'll share some some patient experiences and I uh, it'll really convince you that um, in a slice of time during a 60 minute psychiatric evaluation, uh, you have to be very careful to draw judgment as to whether or not something is reality based or not. Right, so that's a, that's a clinical call, okay. um, and this this episode just reinforces that, right? Uh, even though it's really not bizarre to think that he might actually be married. Really. I'm uh, curious who he would talk about his wife or like to a psychiatrist or to a therapist, right? Who would he be focused on? Right. If it were focused on Elaine in the episode, yeah, but that's mm -hmm. not his own relationship, right? He might not even mention it. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And this is the other, I think, <laughs> teaching point, and this can be reflected on the shelf exam in that. People uh, with paranoia in general, maybe a psychotic disorder, maybe even a cluster A personality, tend not to present the clinical practice with a chief complaint of paranoia, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So, uh, right. So you're going to have to draw that from the clinical vignette. Individuals in this case might actually present it uh, if psychiatrically anxiety and depression caused by, and it, for instance, in a cluster A situation, difficulty with relationships or being concerned about. Um, and indifferent to the evaluation by others, uh, but very unlikely to say, I'm here for my paranoid personality disorder, or I'm here because I'm hypervigilant, they're not going to say that. Um, hence why I even kind of framed um, this discussion that um, Elaine accompanies him. Right? She, yeah. uh, the collateral may actually provide that perspective. So a clinical pearl, as well as one that can, in fact, be uh, reflected uh, on a vignette um, on a shelf exam. So from Elaine's situation, you use the word paranoid. Uh, you, um, I use the word hypervigilant. Um, does she have obsessive compulsive disorder, these obsessions, or does she have a psychotic process or these delusions? And this would be a delusion of persecution, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll take it back. I mean, well, maybe jealousy, it might, might be a mixed delusion. So we'd have to tease that a little bit more. Nonetheless, what differentiates the obsession from the delusion, what differentiates our single best diagnosis being within the anxiety spectrum versus the psychotic spectrum? Anxiety. Okay, so let's Thank let's say but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> that's not right. I mean, certainly there are aspects of, for instance, obsessive compulsive disorder, including compulsive behaviors, that certainly would lean, allow the clinician to lean towards one versus the other. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the circumstance I'm going to paint for you, the patient says, no, I'm not anxious, and no, I don't compulsively wash my hands or engage in any type of ritualistic behaviors. So, and that happens, right? So now what? It's hard because there's some basis in reality. Right. <laughs> and that's what I think would be hard to differentiate in like a in case. Yeah. I mean, prior to 2013, one of the things that we did look at, the APA did endorse, was this idea of bizarre versus non-bizarre. Mm -hmm. And in cases like this, where if the clinician asked themselves, could this actually happen? Um, the answer is a definitive yes. Right. And even in cases when, and we're going to rewrite the end of this um, this episode, that it's not happening. And, and we have that validated. 
it, it still could happen. It's a non bizarre. It's a non bizarre thought. Mm -hmm. um, different from a bizarre thought that um, that when the the individual or the clinician asks, can this actually happen? It's a definitive no, right? Mm -hmm. No, it, this can't happen, right? It breaks the laws of physics, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that could be helpful, but certainly the APA is going away from that designation, right? So um, the other thing I want I want you to look at here is insight, mm -hmm. right? If there's a, if there's a level of insight, doc, I know the way this sounds, and um, I know that this is not true, but I can't get the thought out of my head. That's an obsession. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, a clinical vignette might paint this scenario as such. Real life, probably not. But mm -hmm. the point is, is that whether you're a test taker or you're a clinician behind a desk, um, you want to try to gauge the individual's level of insight. Because if insight is there, you're more likely um, going to be looking at a, uh, an anxiety process. And with absent insight, especially one that is pervasive and consistent or chronic, uh, likely a psychotic process. Um, and in the end, it's none of the above. It is reality based. It's a non it was a non bizarre delusion to begin with, and then at the end, we it's revealed that it's not a delusion at all. Anything else going on with Elaine, other than teaching us about anxiety, the psychotic spectrum? Do you think her past experiences in relationship are what makes it so hard for visualize? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely and positively. Right. So, uh, and what if she presented for a chief's complaint of blank and she began talking about um, the season prior when she met so and so and the season prior to that when she met so and so? Um, as a clinician, as you see this pattern of pervasive behavior, uh, what's a thought that comes in your mind in terms of, okay, let me go back to this season and ask her about. Blank. Where are you going to go with this? This is not a Well, what would what would uh, that's that could be part of it, but where are you going to actually begin to validate that or authenticate that? What's the episode that's going to buy you this? I don't. I want to say diagnosis, but certainly this um, topic or this issue that eventually you're going to have to address with her. Where do people actually have their initial um, relationships, intimate relationships modeled? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does anybody here remember the episode in which I think there's two total where they cast her father? Yeah. 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 I think I think it's only in two episodes. Mm -hmm. Right. And, I, and, I'm, and uh, I might be overstanding it. It might be just the one with, I think it's the jacket, mm -hmm. right? And there, I mean, you get your, there's, he doesn't need to be in anymore, right? Only mm -hmm. one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so yes, her, her pattern of relationships, uh, including the primordial relationship with dad. Mm -hmm. And they cast this character perfectly to understand why she would be so hypervigilant. He's, he's incredibly emotionally distant and cold. Yeah, so cold that um, when she's late, um, um, and therefore she leaves Jerry and George at the restaurant to meet with him. Um, Jerry leaves. Mm -hmm. Jerry gets out of there. Oh, I see very passionate in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else with Elaine? Mm -hmm. But I, I I know I'm going to say this, and you guys are going to stare at me blankly. And if one of you if one of you doesn't, it's going to make my Friday. So I'm just prepping you, the actor. Um, and I, I I apologize for not knowing his name. The actor that is cast as Elaine's father is the same actor that is the uh, the boss in Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. so, so we have Tarantino. Tarantino. Oh, okay. <laughs> my, my weekend is made. <laughs> and by the way, it's a, it's a very similar character. I, th I think after the episode, and after the restaurant, he actually goes and puts together this team. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really it's a very similar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other characters? Seifeld. It's just a Jerry Kramer subplot. A Jerry and Kramer. Um, about this, like, hiding this key everywhere. Didn't. Your favorite belongings, but not actually locking them up at all, you know, until like, yeah, animals up out here. Yep, there's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, the um the first relationship we ever see forged in the situational comedy is the one between Jerry and Graver. Now, 
were given background then that Jerry knew George from high school. Uh, but what we observed, season one, episode one, is the meeting between Jerry and Kramer. That's the very first relationship that we see actually come together. Uh, and um, Larry David reminds us of that in the finale when there's a flashback to that very first scene, season one, episode one. Um, and then since then, uh, even though we do see aspects of Kramer's apartment, um, well, I'll, I'll make a statement about that in a second. Um, the vast majority of the interaction between these two friends occurs in Jerry's apartment and the pathological character is Kramer. I mean, Kramer beats to the, uh, marches to the beat of his own drum. He has aspects of cluster eight personality and his personality pervades Jerry's space. And we see it again here. I mean, he, he has this, he's got this inner reality um, of what the, what the meaning behind this key is. It doesn't matter what breaking news is on TV. It doesn't matter. We don't, I mean, we hardly ever see him work, hold on a job. All those things that we would expect to be the day-to-day -day goings on of a person, which is by the way, what this series is about, is totally absent from this character's life and reality. Uh, yet he's not psychotic, right? Never hears things, never, uh, no real delusions. Uh, I'm sure we could select here and there and have that discussion um, with some selected episodes, but um, really a cluster A personality and a cluster A personality that is really in Jerry's space. It's a very interesting interaction. Um, the few times that we do see the inside of his apartment, uh, Larry David gives us only a very limited glimpse and there's always some oddity with it. Um, you know, the, I mean, an easy example of this is the um, episode that's titled The Merv Griffin Show, where the entire set of the Merv Griffin show is is rebuilt, reconstructed within his apartment. So we really don't even get to see his apartment, we get to see the stage of the old Merv Griffin show. So um, even when we do see Kramer's apartment on the inside, usually we really don't see Kramer's apartment. We see him in the shower, baking lettuce. We see him putting um, guests and visitors to New York City in large drawers, um, just really odd stuff. Nothing we would expect when we actually view uh, somebody's apartment like we see Jerry's, like every single episode. Uh, anything else about the interaction between Jerry and Kramer beyond the typical when it comes to the key? Uh, in how he hides it and, and like most people's places that everyone would find yeah and again um again getting to cluster a traits when when any reasonable person would stumble upon the kid right the the, the the buzzer doesn't work who wouldn't look um we have a character kramer that interprets it through his own filter mm. right you just can't stop yourself there Right. He, I mean, <laughs> right. Um, again, th that's aspects of paranoid personality. Right. And I don't, while I, while I don't think that Kramer has paranoid personality disorder, I think you need four criteria towards the diagnosis. Um, um, I really think he's more of a schizoid, schizotypal spectrum, but um, we're reminded that these traits do tend to cluster. So people with Another cluster A personality other than paranoid uh, can and you often do incorporate paranoid traits and that that's on this way here. Right. And it's actually interesting to have another friend with personality. So that's true. So bizarre and like typically people in that personality cluster do tend to isolate more and be less social. Which is Pretty social. Definitely. He, only with those four, though, yeah. right? Because when we hear of all of the, all of his other interactions, um, and we'll include Newman in that too, but when we hear about all of his other interactions, it's per patient report, it's self-report, and I think all of us may have at, at least one time considered that none of these people are real, right? None of them really showed up uh, when Larry David marched every character up to that witness stand mm -hmm. in the finale, the two-part mm -hmm. finale. And there's even one episode, and I keep on referencing this episode for Kramer and in discussions about Kramer. Um, I'm going to have to figure out what the actual name of the episode is. But uh, Jerry turns to Kramer and says, all these people you mentioned, how can we never met them? 
right? So even, even Jerry suggests that they're a figment of his imagination, and that really gets to the defense mechanism of fantasy. Mm -hmm. Um, and in Kramer's case, age inappropriate fantasy. Right? So fa fantasy as a defense, the autistic retreat into an inner world to protect people from the imminent threat they deem from the real world um, is normal when age appropriate, right? So um, tea parties and imaginary friends completely appropriate when you're three or four. Um, when you're 33 or 34, that's not the case, right? That, that could be the core to a schizoid personality disorder and with any eccentricity behavior, perhaps even a schizotypal personality, right? Fantasy. Other characters in the strong box you want to discuss in the interaction? Clutch your eye. This is George. <laughs> it's always George. <laughs> um, trying to break up with this woman and she just says no and he's like okay and yeah <laughs> he just keeps letting that happen so what's that about i'm trying to figure out like if this is like a low self esteem that's thing. that, that I, I don't think like, there's, there's any way you could discuss this without mentioning yeah <laughs> um so let's go down that road. So what 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 what's part of the evaluation of self esteem? I mean, not not met. I don't want no metrics or anything, but what what's part of this discussion? Some social learning theory. I guess a little bit of how he views himself. Sorry. Uh, I guess a little bit of how oh, George sorry, views I, himself I'm, I'm generally so and how he's like his have young parents. Um, he was definitely not raised in a loving, supportive environment that praised him for any of his successes. He was constantly like put down or compared to other neighborhood. There's like the classic, like Lloyd Braun, like you're never going to be like him. Um, so I think his self-worth is not necessarily the greatest. Um, uh, that's, so that's I do feel like his polite, girlfriends in this <laughs> are a bit um, gaslighty and will kind of just say like, no, even though he'll like give out like justifications and try to stand with his guns, like they really are also just denying anything that he says and any like grounds that any of those feelings could be real. Yep. And going off that, that criticalness and the comparison is like it's hard to how you create up your self-esteem, right? Like we have a lot of downward comparisons of people you grew up with or people you know. Yeah. You know, Self-care is very strong. Very similar. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, and, and you know, the clinical term of a, a external locus of control mm -hmm. is, is sometimes used to describe this process, mm -hmm. uh, these comparisons that we then internalize. Um, and um, I think what Larry David does in this episode is that he really personifies that. I mean, what, what better example, over-the-top example, of an external looks of control, but when you break up with someone and they tell you no. I mean, mm -hmm. she has total control over that dynamic, external locus. Um, so from his perspective, from his inner experience, he doesn't consider himself broken up. Uh, that's correct terminology, mm -hmm. right? Because he can't. Uh, and again, I, I'm not sure this is truly congruent with reality and what um, a person in real clinical practice would necessarily endure, I don't know if anyone ever would think that they're not broken up, but um, very symbolically, this is an external locus of control. This is a person whose entire self or uh, evaluation, evaluation of oneself is dictated by what, how others perceive them. Right? We're seeing this more and more and more uh, because of social media, right? I mean, it's not who you are, it's how many likes you get. It reminds me of like that wheel of power control we can kind of talk about in domestic violence situations. Yes. And it's very like, emotionally beautiful all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very consistent with that as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um never, I mean, there's really no episode at all that would provide any information that there was physical abuse in the Costanza house, but the the, the emotional abuse <laughs> can definitely lend to that. And and I don't think anybody has any. Uh, would have any objection to talking about um, George's early life experiences as being emotionally abusive, right? I mean, his parents are emotionally abusive in his 30s. So. And we and we do get some flashbacks, which, by the way, this is the prompt that I always bring up. If anybody wants to partner, contacting Netflix, um, a young George Costanza spinoff, I, it would be a can't miss. I, I, can't, I couldn't even fathom what a seven-year-old George Costanza, like young Shelton, Shelton yeah. Yeah. A uh, young Costanza would be an absolute smash hit. I don't know who would be cast, but it would be. A, it would be. A, it, there's no way that would ever miss. 
Uh, would not want to go back and look at that. <laughs> All right, we have five minutes left. Any final thoughts? Uh, any other observations anyone's made that you want to discuss? Now we're good. All right, we'll leave it here. Uh, give us a couple of minutes, uh, logging off, logging back on for our um, table rounds, and we'll catch everybody else um, on the other Zoom link. Thank you, everybody.